On behalf of our board of directors and myself, thank you so much for being here. I also want to welcome our partners. We have um, we have Wells Fargo here, advisor, please stand. One of our corporate sponsors, you can't do it without them. And also we have another partner here, Michelle. Michelle from Accenture, he would please stand. And our partners allow us to do everything that we can do for the chapter. Without them, we couldn't do anything. So thank you so much for supporting the National Life and Data Atlanta chapter. And thank you for being here this evening. I know it's a hustle bustle to be here on Monday downtown, but we appreciate you. You're in for a treat tonight. And with that said, I will turn it over to our program director. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi, my name is Tamara McLaurin. I am your director of programs. And I'm excited about our program for the evening. We're going to be doing something a little bit different this evening. Um, normally we have a panel and we um, do Q&A throughout the panel. But this time we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have three signature um, keynote speakers. So we will have, and I'm going to introduce each of them as they come up. But uh, Michelle Gaston Williams will be speaking on your career. Ron Green will be speaking on your health and wealth, and Nick Nelson will be speaking on your brand. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker for the evening, and we will be doing Q&A at the end, so um, we'll have time to ask some questions. Michelle Gaskin is the Managing Director of North America Inclusion and Diversity at Accenture, and has more than 25 years of, as, 25 years of experience as an advocate for equality within corporate America. She is the author of the award-winning book, Klein, taking every step with conviction, courage, and calculated risk to achieve a thriving career and a successful life, which I believe she's going to talk about today, a professional playbook offering guidance to women in the contemporary workplace, a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the Executive Leadership Council. <laughs> I'm say that again. And she said so. so yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Serves on several boards, including the Jackie Robinson Foundation, Black Girls Rock, and the SELE Lupus Foundation. She is also an executive committee member of the Women's Leadership Board of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She received bachelor's degrees in marketing and communications from King College of New Jersey and a master in organizational dynamics from the University of Pennsylvania. Michelle and her husband live in New York City. Let's welcome Michelle Gaston. So let me indulge you for one second. Almost crumbling to the ground, she stopped. Looking at how far she had traveled and everything it took for her to get there, she took a step back. She recognized her strength and everything that she had inside of her. She looked behind her. She looked forward. Taking a step back in terms of everything she had gained along the way in her journey, she paused. She stood steadfast, stood in her resolve, and taking in her inner power. This is an excerpt from an essay from one of my favorite writers, Terry St. Cloud, and it appropriately describes what I would call or define as the climb. Now, the act of climbing, as we all know, by definition, it means to go upward with gradual or continual pro uh, progress. And it's a term that I've used over the years to describe my career as a woman of color and as a diversity executive. Now, there are some individuals that have an easy go of it uh, in corporate America who can take the proverbial elevator up to the C-suite, and others, not so much. They're forced to take the stairs with a backpack and no air conditioning. But no matter how you ascend, there is a journey that we each experience that ebbs and flows and twists and turns. And with every step, you get that much closer to reaching your North Star, as I call it. So Climb, which is a book that I wrote about 15 months ago, speaks volumes about my professional journey. I'm passionate about helping the next generation of leaders realize their full potential, but also to ascend from the rungs of wherever they sit in whatever organization they are employed. So come along with me in my journey. So 
My journey started on the day of my birth, May 21st, 1960. Okay, we're not going down that road. <laughs> but as you can see from the picture, I am an identical twin. I am the one sitting. My twin sister, Dr. Monique Witherspoon, is standing behind me. And despite identical appearances, studies show that identical twins prefer their own unique sense of self or their own identity. And that's something that I, sh I wrestled with over the years. Now, while my sister and I have a close, special bond, I always wrestled with finding my own unique sense of self and what were some of the kinds of things that I needed to do in order to achieve that. For the longest time, I thought my name was Twin because our neighbors in North Edison, New Jersey would call us Twin instead of by our first names. So we were raised by Southern parents with low, uh, low country South Carolina values. My father an entrepreneur, my mother an executive, and my parents believed in what I would define as unrelenting straight talk. And what I mean by that is this. So every morning before I would go to school, my father would ask my sisters and I, so girls, what do you want to do? Where do you want to be? Where do you want to go? Now, these are sophisticated questions to ask kindergartners, but that's my dad, and this was his way of nurturing our talents and allowing us to be very articulate, crisp, and succinct in terms of what it was that we wanted to do with our lives. You know, it's one of those, one of those things that I, I remember fondly my father would always say to us, you're not here to take up space, you're here to make a difference, and it's up to you to determine what that difference is. And I certainly took that to heart. Now, a mentor mentioned to me recently that success means living a life of meaning and value, and I certainly would agree. And my passion and my purpose is intertwined, and I've had the fortunate, uh, the, the, the honor and the privilege of being able to work closely with and alongside some of the world's most pro prolific leaders uh, over the years. My passion is my why, and my purpose is my conviction. And as I mentioned, they're certainly intertwined, and my passion is developing the next generation of leaders to realize their potential and to envision what's possible. All I've ever wanted to do, and I say this uh, incessantly, all I've ever wanted to do in any organization where I've ever worked is to leave the place in better condition than when I entered. That's it. I didn't want to be anybody's CEO, CHRO, or anything like that. Um, but what I would do every single year, at the top of the year, is to go through this mental exercise of asking myself the following questions. You know, what are you passionate about? What, do you want to, what problems do you want to solve? How are you going to exert your power once you receive it? What are some of the kinds of things that are you going to do in order to get to your next, to your North Star? So every year I would ask myself these questions, and for those of you sitting in the audience, it's okay if you don't know, but what I would say is to think about the kind of passion, the kind of purpose, the kind of power that you want to own and exert along the way. So I've been a diversity practitioner for 30 years in a number of different industries. Consumer goods, big pharma, financial services, and more recently, professional services. And I love what I do. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is that membership into the corporate elite certainly doesn't come easy, at least not for, for many of us. It requires more than just intellectual horsepower. It requires a, a keen sense of self, grit, resilience, mentors, sponsors, and a willingness to consistently perform at a higher standard. And you know what the saying goes, at least in, in the household I was raised in, you have to be twice as good and you might get half as far. My parents had very high expectation for themselves and that translated into high expectations uh, for ourselves, their daughters. And I consistently challenged myself to keep up and to push myself to to do my best every single day and to compete with the best and the brightest. And this is how I've approached my work every single day because I knew 
that I am working and competing in a system that wasn't built for individuals who look like me. And I've always volunteered for the tough assignments and the most visible projects. In 2002, I decided to go back to grad school and to obtain a master's degree. Now the easy thing for me would have, at the time would have been to go to a state school in New Jersey, which is where I, where I was working at the time. But I decided to pursue a degree at an Ivy League institution where I drove one way two and a half hours from my office three days a week uh, for two years to obtain that degree. Because I knew that that prestigious Ivy League degree was going to allow me to be bigger, better, bolder, faster in the industry that I was working in at the time, and that was Big Pharma. that over the years I've benefited from the relationships that I've had with both mentors and sponsors and there is a difference and I know many of us know what those what the differences are in this room I enjoy sports so I'm going to give you a sports analogy uh, I would define a person uh, a mentor as your personal coach so this is the person that's going to help you to flex those leadership muscles to help you to figure out all of the traditional methodologies of engaging uh, within an organization and assimilating within that culture. A sponsor, however, that's your sports agent. That's the person that's sitting at the table advocating, championing for you where it counts. They have the influence to ensure that your name is being brought up for those stretch assignments and promotions as they make themselves available. And you know, it's really interesting. One of my mentors used to say, if you're the smartest person in the room, to find a new room. Well, I found several rooms. And I, I've, I have a number of mentors and sponsors who have been my champion and my advocate over the years. And this is a picture of myself and Alex Gorski. Alex, when I worked for him 20 years ago, he was the CEO of Novartis Pharmaceuticals. And his leadership was legendary. Here's a guy from the Midwest uh, who went to West Point and also went to Wharton, uh, but understood diversity practice incredibly well. His leadership was legendary, and many of us followed him. And I was his chief diversity officer for a number of years, and that was 20 plus years ago, and I still talk to Alex to this day. And He calls me for counsel, although I haven't worked for him for a number of years. I still keep that relationship alive. Uh, the other person, as you can see from the far right, I worked on Wall Street for a number of years, Rob Schaefer. Uh, was the asset, uh, head of asset management at Credit Suisse for a number of years. And then there's Dr. Oz, and these are individuals who I've cultivated, maintained, and sustained relationships with over a number of years. So the, the, the point here, ladies and gentlemen, is no matter how senior you become in an or organization, no matter how old you think you are, uh, these relationships are meaningful, and I rely heavily on these relationships as I move forward in my career. Now, one of the things that I've done in my career is I have made it a point to differentiate myself from most of my peers uh, in all of the industries where I've worked. I've spent two-thirds of my career outside of the United States. I've lived in Istanbul, Turkey for a number of years. I've lived in Hong Kong for a number of years. And I spent 10 years in Switzerland uh, and this is where I lived for the past 10 years, and I just came back to the States five years ago. So I'm just starting to hear uh, and understand one language a day. I speak three languages. And one of the things that I enjoy most about this experience is that not only was I one of the few executives who wanted to do that, uh, but I stretched and grew as an executive in a lot of different ways. Because you learn about cultural competence. You learn about being the only one in the room. And when I worked at Novartis Pharmaceutical, which is what took me to Switzerland, I was the first woman and the first black executive in the company who had an office in the C-suite in the history of that 100 plus year company. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to test myself and my leadership. 
uh, in terms of living and working in an environment where that was uncomfortable. And that certainly was it. Uh, clearly, I'm not Swiss. Clearly, um, it, it was uh, certainly one of those opportunities that presented itself to me, and I'm all the better for it as an executive. Um, I still have a lot of, of, of fond memories living there. My husband didn't want to come back. I said, I am not Tina Turner. I'm not staying in Switzerland for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, so this is my husband, David. And they say ambitious people often marry ambitious people. And there was a, a recent study, I believe it was Carnegie Mellon, that talked about how people with supportive partners and or spouses are more likely to give themselves a chance to succeed and make better choices in terms of their careers. And I certainly would agree with that. So David's been my life partner. I've been married for 25 years. And one of the things that I always say to at least anyone that I'm mentoring or anyone that I'm speaking to is make sure that you take care of those who are taking care of you in your career. This gentleman here gave up his distinguished career at AT&T. He was there 22 years before we went to Switzerland so that I could assume my dream. And while we were there, we went on vacation. And during vacation, I made the mistake of blackberrying. Remember those? I was blackberrying the entire time and working the entire time. And after two days of that, he looked at me and said, Michelle, are you here with me or are you here to do that? And I saw the disappointment in his eyes and I said, wow, I, I, here's a guy who gave up everything for me and the least I could do is be present for him. And I wasn't even doing that. So my point in raising this is to take care of those who are, take, who, who are uh, supporting you, your ecosystem as I call it. Now David and I are fine, we're still together. But that was a hard <laughs> lesson for me to learn is that I was so myopic in terms of my career that I lost sight of the most important person in my life at that time, and that's the gentleman in this picture. Finding my fearless self. Um, you know, they say self-discovery um, you know, means digging deep into your soul and, and revealing all of the things that shape you as a human being. And it's unfortunate. Uh, I've had some hard lessons that I've had to learn over the years. Uh, I have sacrificed and made several concessions that I'm certainly not proud of over the years, but at the time it made sense, at least in my mind. I've sacrificed my health in order to pursue an executive career and then spent a good portion of my career focusing on my wellness. And the lesson here is you have to put your, your, your health first, otherwise you won't have a meaningful career. In 2006, I was diagnosed with systemic lupus erythematosus, otherwise known as lupus, and I almost lost my life twice. And so, a career doesn't make sense, at least not in my view, if you don't have your health, if you don't take care of yourself. So, one of the things I, I talk a lot about is reaching back and pulling others along, and I implore all of us to do that. Um, our ambitions as professionals must be broad enough to include the aspirations of others. And it must also include um, being of service to others. I sit on seven not-for-profit boards. I volunteer my time to those things that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about health care, education reform, um, equal rights, social justice, and the arts. And as you can see from these photos, I spend a good part, portion of my time outside of my company sitting on several boards. As you can see, there's Trayvon Martin's mother on the far right. I sit on her board. I invest in uh, movies and, and short films and other things uh, in the arts to tell our stories. That's Will Smith and his wife there. I was one of the organizers for the Women's March in DC in 2016. So as you can see, outside of my executive job, I'm incredibly busy doing the things that I love and that's serving others. And I would implore all of us to do the same where, where you can. I believe that it's our indelible responsibility to ensure that another person succeeds also. Um, I've seen too many times where individuals who look like us will roll up the drawbridge once they've crossed to that executive realm uh, and not bring anyone uh, uh, on the other side along with them. And I would implore all of us to think about that and to do more of that. So in closing, 
I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about um, the lessons that I've learned over the years, but I'll, I, I will talk about the top three. Ask for what you want. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being crisp and articulate about the things that you want out of your career and the things that you don't want. There's no place for self-doubt or, or feedback. Flying stealth, in my view, or under the radar is not an option. It's a little too competitive out here for you to just be good. You have to be great at what you do. And think of yourself as a product. What are some of the kinds of things that are going to differentiate you from everyone else in your field uh, where you can stand out and, and make a difference? So I will leave you with that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michelle. I definitely appreciate you presenting all about your career. So now we're going to move on to the next speaker, Mr. Ron Green. And it's a great segue because he's going to be talking about health and wealth. Um, Ron Green is the, currently a senior vice president and South Region Manager for Wells Fargo Advisors. In his role, he has responsibilities for partnering with the regional president to drive advisor census and productivity, financial performance, and strategic firm initiatives. He leads a team of early career advisors and manages branches, complexes, or markets on an interim basis. Ron received his Master's of Business Administration with a concentration in finance from Duke University. He is also a graduate with honors from North Carolina State University with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. Ron has a passion for helping others and excellence. He has been married for 25 years to his wife, Shavella, and has three children. Please welcome to the stage, Ron. Thank you, Tamara. You're welcome. And um, thank you, Michelle, for those uh, those words to kind of lead off our presentations tonight. Um, I must say, after hearing your speech, I wish I would have went first. <laughs> <laughs> you're a, you're a pretty uh, pretty tough act to follow. Um, but at any rate, I um, want to make just a few comments tonight. I mean, I was uh, as I looked at the kickoff. This was all about you. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is I'd like to talk about us as well as talk about you. So I'd like to share some comments around wealth and around health, but I'd like to put it in the context of how it affects us as a community and then talk about how we can help each other individually. I'd like to start with a story. Um, the story is about November 25th, 1995. It's about myself and my family. And I come from, I'll call it a traditional black family. And if you think about the traditional black families where I grew up, the father was the one that went to work, that handled all the finances. The mother was the one that took care of the family, right? So I'll never forget being in New Orleans, November 25th, 1995. And I was there with my wife, celebrating Thanksgiving with her in-laws. And I got a call from my mom, and it was a bit unexpected, and it kind of affected me even to this day. And the call went something like, hello, Ron, just wanted you to know your father has stage four lung cancer. So it was a deep effect on me. But the interesting thing about it is it wasn't just that my father's health was affected, Again, being in a traditional black family, we had to now try to figure out my mom didn't have the financial wherewithal or the financial skill sets to kind of say, what am I going to do next? So we spent kind of the next few months, the remainder of my father's life, trying to figure out, we've got two big situations, how are we going to deal with them? One was his health. Second was my mother's wealth. And so as I look around the room, I go, how many of us face unexpected situations in our career? So I want to have this conversation talk.
talking about that, but I first want to put it in the context of us as a community. And so if I think about the concerns as I talk, a lot of us face situations, and you even heard uh, Michelle say earlier, you know, unexpected situations, situations that can affect your financial picture. So how do we start to put things in place to address those? I want to first start with the income side. And I want to give you kind of a few statistics, if you will, and it may paint a little bit of a bleak picture, but I do think there's a solution. But I think part of it is we got to start to acknowledge the situation that exists, right? Um, you start to hear in our community a lot of conversations, or I've seen a lot of studies that talk about the income gap, right? The fact that the general population, their income is significantly higher than our income. As a matter of fact, I saw a statistic just today that said, if you think about from 2000 to today, income in the black community has actually declined. And if you think about the income gap, then there's some concern, I see some studies, I don't know if you've seen, about the wealth gap. And what the wealth gap says that um, projections by 2053, the net worth, the average net worth in the black African American community will be zero. So collectively, there's an issue. But again, I want to lead this towards how do we start to address it. So I don't want to just be all gloom and doom. But again, if you think about some of the strategies, there's a study that was done by, by another company. And again, talking about wealth in the black community and our knowledge around certain financial concepts. And if you think about it, as a community, we said, you know, didn't score very high. A lot of us don't have a lot of insight or strategy or knowledge, I would say, around investing. And investing is more of a longer term strategy. But if you think in general as a community, we tend to be more spenders and we tend to be more savers. And both of those strategies, again, when you think of long term wealth building, tends to be tougher to do when you're spending and saving. And one of the issues around spending is we tend to be accumulators of debt. And I like to think of it as twofold. There's good debt and there's bad debt, right? Credit card debt, which tends to be common in our community, high interest rate debt, is where our focus tends to lie. And as a result, that interest tends to absorb the income, and so again, makes it a little more difficult to save and create long-term wealth. Planning for wealth transfer or leaving a legacy. And again, I would like to have had nothing better than to have my father in a position to leave a large legacy to his family, right? <laughs> but just didn't happen that way. But how do we start to put things in place to address them, right? How do we start to look at vehicles? Can't tell you how many people that don't have a will or don't use trust vehicles simply because there's a, we need to have more education around them. But at the end of the day, how do we start to put those things in place so that we can make sure that our next generation, as Michelle mentioned earlier, our next generation is starting to be taken care of. And then lastly, um, think about the study. Um, as a community, they said, hey, I'd love to hear more about how do I start to save for my kids' education? And if you think about it, we're kind of in the cycle of a lot of kids, even today, are taking out student loans to finance their education. And if you think about that, again, in the same study that was done, um, it says it takes 21 years to pay off a student loan, right? So I'm not saying don't do it because we have to be in a position to do what we can, but hey, 
how can we start to plan and think about it and potentially avoid those issues? Help. Now, I'm no doctor. Um, and again, Michelle started to address this. But when you consider some of the top health concerns, we're at higher risk in some really major areas. When you think about heart disease or cancer or strokes. Now, the interesting thing is we got to take better care of ourselves from a fitness perspective. But when I think about it, as a financial advisor, I go the challenge of having a higher risk of health issues is that sometimes in the black community, there's a less likelihood to have health insurance or to have disability insurance. The other thing that's interesting in um, our community and I looked at myself as being in this situation, is we tend to be caregivers. How many of us are in positions where we're either helping our mother or brother or someone else with health issues? And a lot of times, unexpectedly, we tend to have to finance some of those issues as well, right? So not having strategies such as long-term care, right? to address some of those issues puts us in a position where we may not have income to start, again, to build long-term wealth. So, how do we begin to address the issue? Not just as a community, but as people in the room. How do we start to engage in this conversation. Now, I'm not here to say again, I have all the answers. And so a conversation would be great to have. And I look forward to starting to have some dialogue with some of you or even conversations in the community about how we start to address some of these issues. But one thought is how do we start to develop a financial plan for our situations? So what is a financial plan, right? A financial plan is simply the process of putting together strategies and product solutions in place to solve problems and achieve goals, right? And so when you think about strategies or you think about goals, how do we start to assess the likelihood of achieving them or the discipline that we've got to put into place to achieve them? Right? Now, at Wells Fargo, our financial plan is called the Envision Process. And I don't want to make a product pitch or sell, but I just want you to look at the slide as more the process of have a financial plan. And as part of your financial plan, how do we start to address unexpected issues? Building in, let's say, the cost of taking care of your family. How does that affect your financial picture? Or how much do we need to accumulate in, let's say, short-term savings so that if there's an emergency that comes up, we're in a position to address it. So with financial planning, again, it's an iterative process. It's not a one-time thing, but the beauty is it's all about a conversation, right? What do I need to do by way of what are my goals? What's the likelihood of achieving my goals? What are things that can derail me from achieving those goals? What strategies do I now need to put in place? And then how do I begin this iterative process of just monitoring and having those conversations? Now the interesting thing, and I'll turn it back to us and even people in the room, is only 14% of black African Americans actually work with a financial advisor. And the focus of most financial advisors tends to be, how do we start to help people put a financial plan in place? And that's not just people in the community that 
may not be in a position to develop a financial plan or may not have a wealth picture that they feel a plan is appropriate, but that's us in the room, right? How do we start to have a plan to address these issues? Now, the benefit of planning, and I tie it back in terms of health and wealth, is as you have a comfort level to do the things that you want to accomplish, as you have a comfort level to achieve those dreams, all of a sudden there's a confidence level and, and the stress can tend to go away. Right? I mean, I think back, there was a slide before, we talk about stresses that we have in place. Again, most people, when they go home at night, the stress is, can I do what I need to do? Do I have enough money put away to retire? Back to, do I have money to help my kids go through college? We just finished tax season. Can I even afford to pay my taxes? Right? So as we're able to start to address some of those things through the planning, opportunities to start to reduce the stress picture, start to address some of the health issues, okay? And then lastly, um, in terms of what can we do to start to address some of the issues? I'd like nothing better, personally, than to see more black financial advisors in the industry. And so the interesting thing is that there's such a shortage. There's only about, there's less than 10% of the advisors in the industry that are black African American. Now, I don't want to say that's the reason that people in the black community don't deal with a financial advisor, because we should all be able to deal with who we want, right? But I think people want to come into an office or they want to be able to talk to someone or even work with a firm and say the offices or the ideals of the firm I'm working with, the advisor I'm working with, reflect the community that we live in. And so part of the role of a, of a financial advisor, part of the strategy or the thought about better understanding the financial advisory role is first to understand what a financial advisor does. And the interesting thing is, I think there's somewhat of a misnomer. And I know when I first thought about being a financial advisor, and I go back to my school days, you know, I saw that movie Wall Street. And so I thought I was gonna call somebody and tell them like, hey, here's some idea, and it was gonna make them a ton of money. And that may not have been in the best interest of the person, but a lot of people think that's what a financial advisor does. But that's not what we do. So, what does a financial advisor do? Helping people get peace of mind. Helping people get a comfort level that the things that are important to them, they are on track to achieve. Meeting people and building trust and being a problem solver. It's a noble profession. So I'd encourage you to find out more about it. And even at Wells Fargo Advisors, there are opportunities that are available for the right people. And there are opportunities as next generation talent, as mentioned earlier, people coming into the industry that may not have the experience but there's career paths that will allow you to get the experience. It's good to have someone that could be a second career individual. The beauty of being a financial advisor is you can be an entrepreneur, you can build something. That's what attracted me to the business a long time ago. And it doesn't hurt if you like money to be able to talk to people about money and wealth. And then lastly, if you're an experienced advisor, right? What's the right firm for you that will allow you to flourish and do those things? So I'd encourage you that if you're not aware of the position and you have an interest, have colleagues in the room that are happy to talk more about what do financial advisors do? What are those opportunities that may be available? And I'd encourage you to look at it. And again, a career that can be 
you can have a lot of success and definitely ways to address that income gap that I talked about earlier. So in closing, and again, thank you for the opportunity to speak, but I'd encourage you, start now to develop a plan to address your financial picture, start to develop a plan to make sure from a health perspective you're taken care of, and then lastly, I'd like nothing better than to talk to any of you that have an interest but would love to see more financial advisors in the business. So thank you. Last, but definitely not least, uh, we have Mr. Nick Nelson who will be coming forward to speak about your brand. Nick Nelson is an award-winning brand strategist, creative executive, and CEO of Brandpreneur the nation's leading brand development, image development, and executive presence firm for the digital age. Brandpreneur helps remarkable people who show up well in person, show up equally as well online by developing brand strategies, creating assets, which includes photography, videography, graphic design, web design, in support of that strategy and teaching clients how to get noticed by creating custom content across social media themselves. Not limited to immersing himself in solution-oriented ideas that only impacts his clients, Nelson desires to positively impact the lives of business professionals worldwide, prompted him his exploration into authorship. His de debut book, Stay Tuned, is an instructional guide to overcoming life-altering challenges and finding a path to personal fulfillment. His undeniable Foresight in business and engaging spin on real world issues keeps audience captivated, making him an in demand keynote speaker. So, coming to the stage is Nick Nelson. Good evening, my name is Nick Nelson. Um, repeat after me My website is not my brain. My website is not my brain. Very good, very good, very good. Repeat after me, my logo is not my brain. My logo is not my brain. You guys do wonderful work. I want you to know that. Um, repeat after me, my job, now this is going to be tough. It's going to be tough for some of y'all. My job is not my brain. My job is not my brain. I need y'all to say that one more time. Okay. All right? My job is not my brain. My job is not my brain. All right, let me tell you what a brand is. Um, a brand is two things and two things only. Okay? A brand is what do you want to be known for and how do you want to make people feel. The best brands in the world are known for something and they make people feel a certain way. You can run this litmus test through any brand worth its weight in gold. And if they make, if they're known for something and make you feel a certain way, then they are an effective brand. The one brand that I, one of the many brands that I cite that is an effective brand, Chick-fil-A. When I go to my 10-year-old son and I say, Quinn, what does Chick-fil-A do? Well, Daddy, they make chicken. Very good son. Now, just because they make chicken and they're known for chicken doesn't mean that they don't make it delicious off palm. Doesn't mean that they don't have wonderful fries or chicken nuggets, a different variation of chicken. What it means is that they're known for chicken and even tell you to eat more what? Chicken. Very good. I asked him, son, how does it make you feel? Daddy, it makes me feel good. That's the reason why any time of day you can go to Chick-fil-A and the line is around the corner. Go in the off hours. What you think is the off hours? That's prime time for Chick-fil-A. <laughs> right? Because they're known for something and they make you feel a certain way. Way. Far too often, when I deal with individuals and I work with people, they think, well, you know what, Nick, um, first of all, I don't need to become a brand. If you think that, let me tell you something, you're already a brand. All you have to do is type in your name in Google and Atlanta, if you want to even get more specific, and see what shows up. If something shows up, whatever that is, that's your brand, or at least the one that people see online. Typically what shows up first, if you have a website, ideally it would be your website. Many of you don't. Many of you don't even own your own domain name. Um, next up would be your LinkedIn. 
that you haven't updated in quite some time, right? That looks more like a resume than it does any sort of profile for you. The next up might be your Twitter handle that you haven't touched since Twitter was popular, right? And then a few erroneous pictures here and there, uh, if you even see yourself at all. Now, again, I tell you, people meet you online these days before they meet you in person. Yep. They meet you online, these, but yet we spend more time on what we look like in person, how we deliver in person, the in-person experience. Oh man, some of y'all show up good in person. You're clean, you got your cufflinks on, right? You got your good smell on, you're, you're polished. Online you look ragged. <laughs> ragged, terrible, horrible, horrible, horrible. You're bald and you have hair online. Man, there's a disconnect there. Right, so my ladies, y'all changing hairstyles every month. But on, on LinkedIn, you look one way. On Facebook, you look one way. If you have an Instagram, you look one way. I don't know who is who. Like, what are we doing here? There is no continuity. Right? Again, people meet you online first before they meet you in person. What do you want to be known for? How do you want to make people feel? That is a brand. All right? Now, once you make it in your mind that you know what, yes, I need to become a brand. There are a few things that you need to do. I encourage you to write all of these down. Think about them. This is your homework from me for the evening. If you want to give me your answers, Nick F. Nelson on LinkedIn, at Brandpreneur on Instagram. I answer everything. All right? First one is, who am I? If you are a corporation, that will be your mission and vision statement. That's the foundation of a brand. That shows values. What do you value? What do you care for? What don't you care for? What places will you go to? What places won't you go to? Who are you is the one question that many of you in this room have no clue because you really haven't thought about it in a while. See, becoming a brand is one of those things that, especially for my corporate partners, um, you really put off to the side because you're busy in corporate. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I want you to be there. We need to have presence there. Right? But don't make it just about that. Because actually, your brand is critical to your corporation because people don't buy brands. They buy people. They don't buy into brands, they buy into people. The people that service that brand. Those brands need you, but you also can leverage them as well to help elevate you. But in order to do that, you have to know who you are. Oftentimes in terms of learning who you are, it's one of those things where you think about what do I want to have impact on? Who do I want to have impact on? In, in my Leadership Atlanta experience, I remember one of the last classes I went to, a gentleman said, how do you want to die? Or how do you die a good death? And, you know, I, I, I've heard, I've been to many leadership seminars, but when he said, how do you die a good death? That really got me thinking. And I thought about my father. In 2013, he passed away at his funeral. Um, People from all over the country came by, similar to your experience. Mother has dementia, had to figure out what, what I was going to, how I was going to take care of mom. But my father had passed away, just passed away. Um, uh, professor at Ohio State University for 40 years, founded the Black Studies Movement there. And people just kept on saying, oh man, your dad had impact on me, he had impact on me, he had impact on me. And I thought about it, here I am, working for an owned agency at the time called Liquid Soul. Uh, doing entertainment marketing, big films, red carpets, LA, New York, and felt like I wasn't having an impact. And I said, you know what? How do I die a good death? I want to have impact the same way my dad did. So, at the right age of 45 years old, I made a pivot. Who in the hell makes a pivot at 45 years old? Who in their right mind 
start something new from ground zero at 45 years old. Me, right? I did. I did. And so, um, but I said, you know what? I want to invest in people, and I want to. When I close my eyes, I want to have the same thing. Oh man, I want. I want my son to be inundated. Oh, your daddy changed my life. But you gotta understand what do you want to be known for? All right, and you gotta understand who are you. The number two, after you know who are you, is what do you do? My high performing individuals, this is the hardest thing. All of y'all are schizophrenic. And when I say schizophrenic, well, Nick, you know what? Uh, I'm a diversity inclusion executive during the daytime, but I like motivational speaking, but I want to write a book, but I'm passionate about my community, uh, but uh, I sing in the choir at church, and I'm singing solo on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, that's great, that's great, that's great. Pick one. Pick one. Pick one. The reason why you have to pick one is because everybody has ADD right now, right? People don't have time to figure you out. And if you don't pick one, you can't focus. And if you can't focus, how can you expect somebody to be able to sell you? And at the end of the day, one of the things that makes brands work is having other people sell you, not just you. And it's just, again, not just entrepreneurial, selling you with inside of your organization. What is it that you want to be known for? What is it that you do? What do you do? What do you do? Now, pick one and build everything else around that one. Back in the day, the plumber was the plumber. The electrician was the electrician, right? The cable man that you stole cable from was the cable man, <laughs> right? But it wasn't the cable man, plumber, slash electrician. No, no, there was a differentiator. Same thing, especially online nowadays, because we don't have time to figure you out. Who are you? What do you do? Who do you do it for? That's your target audience. Don't think everybody is going to get into you. They won't. They won't. I know very well. I am, I am not that ignorant. I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Right? Nor do I want to be. I want to be very targeted. And those people that want to do business with me will come. Right? Because other thing you got to remember here is, is that you're an experience. See, when you treat yourself and you think of yourself as an experience, you're a little bit more, one word, intentional. See, Experiences tend to be memorable. That's why big brands go to festivals such as Essence Fest. Have you doing the cha-cha slide and every other line dance out there? Because they want you to experience them. They want you to feel something, right? But you gotta understand who your target audience is. Now, once you understand who your target audience is, uh, a little hint here is, the target audience is, your target audience is, is somebody that you solve a problem for, all right? And that goes into the third thing, what is it that these people want and need? What problem are you solving? The biggest brands in the world know how to solve a problem. Any business worth its weight solves a problem that's actually a problem. Part of what I see is that you have individuals that are doing stuff and solving no problem. Writing a book that nobody asked for and wondering why they got a stack full of them in the garage. <laughs> Starting that business that nobody asked for, wondering why they can't get clients, right? It's almost like that Will Smith movie, what the, the, the pursuit of happiness with the lot. He had all the boxes in there. Did nobody want that thing? Right? He wasn't solving a problem. Right? Now, you gotta understand what problem are you solving for and who? That's an actual problem. Right? But what you're doing now is you've gone from who are you, who you do it for, what those people want and need your target audience, what problem are you solving for them, right? Then you have to look at what is so special about you. Because many times, you're not the only person trying to solve that problem for that particular audience. This is what I call my life coach. 
Oh my God, there's so many life coaches out there. A thousand and one. Everybody want to tell you about your life, right? Or there's so many public speakers. Oh, Nick, I just want you to public speak. Well, what do you want to speak about in the who? And why should they listen, right? What makes you so special? Oftentimes, you have to look deep within in terms of what is it that you know? If you know a thing, you teach a thing. What do you know above and beyond that the next person doesn't know? Style. What is your style? You know, I'm very loud, and I know I'm very loud. I'm very boisterous, and I'm in your face. But that's my style. That's authentically who I am. I can't be quiet. No one in my family, if you go to my family barbecue, guess what? We're the loudest ones in the park. Right? Because that's authentically who I am. See, people appreciate authenticity. Don't think you can't be authentic wherever you are. It's just different variations of authenticity. But still, show up. Show up. But depending upon where you are, you might just have to show up a little differently. But it really is understanding what makes you special. Sometimes that one thing that makes you special is the one thing that you think, oh, well, you know what, that's beneath me. That's what I call my syndrome. You know, I'm, a lot of what I do spans within, a, a good portion of that is videography and photography stuff. Here I am, you know, chief marketing officer of Liquid Soul, started a company, you know, working with high level, you know, organizations, CEOs of companies, vice presidents of marketing, and here I am running around with a big camera bag taking pictures of folks. And I'm like, what in the hell is wrong? with me. Made no sense until it did. Made no sense until it did. Sometimes that one gift that you have is staring you right in between the eyes. When they say if they had a better snake, it would have bit you. But your ego gets in the way. You get in the way. You get in your head. I mean so many people that just stay in the, they live in their head. What will people think? How will people respond? So what? People can't live your life, only you can. And if they're going to be with you, they'll be with you. If not, at least you know. But what makes you so special? What do people get as a result of experiencing you? That's in business terms what they call your return on investment. What's the return on investment in experiencing you and engaging with you? Why should I spend the time? Because time, as we all know, is our most valuable asset. Why am I spending time with you? What's the return? You have to be able to very succinctly articulate that. And it needs to be valid, at least in the eyes of the person that you're going after. After you have who you are, what you do, who you do it for, what those people want and need, what they get as a result, what your superpower is, the next and most critical thing that many of you are not doing is telling your story. And it's an online story. Remember, online is where people meet you first. But yet, many of you do not take it seriously. How many of you here are on any sort of social media platform? Raise your hand. Most of you are. How many, other than the occasional selfie, and the family pick, post, or say anything. Mm. 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 That's not a whole lot. Oh, mama, I know you post. I see your stuff all the time. You, 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 you are super connected. Yes, you are. Now, let me tell you something. You have to treat yourself these days like a media company. What do I mean by that, Nick? Media companies, let's just say NBC. NBC has what they call their broadcast network. Their air, right? They own it. During, throughout the course of the day, they have various programming targeted to different audiences that advertisers pay for. That's how they make money. Now, depending upon the types of programming that they have, that's what makes them different than their competitors, right? Now, you also have a broadcast network. 
It's called your LinkedIn. It's called your Facebook. It's called your Instagram. It's called your Twitter. It's called your Pinterest. It's called your Snapchat if you're on that. Now, you have the ability to create a narrative. See, far too many of you, far too many of you, give authorship to your brand to other people. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. You let people tell you how much you're worth. You let other people tell you what you're good at, what you're not good at. You let people post on your page. If you're not private, some people just don't want to show anybody anything. You get all antsy if somebody sends you a friend connection. I don't know who this is. Who is this? What, what is this all about? I don't know who they are. <laughs> you get paranoid. You get paranoid. You get paranoid. Let me tell you something. Nowadays, people are voyeuristic. They want to watch. Let them watch. Let them watch. Give them something to look at. You're watching. All of you are watching. All of you are voyeuristic. All of you are talking about people. All of you want to see where everybody is. But not all of you are creating your narrative, right? Your pages are outdated. I was with a client today, I promise you. I asked her, I said, do you have an Instagram? She said, oh, yes, I have an Instagram. Wonderful. I said, good, at least I don't have to start from the beginning today. We open up Instagram, one little sad picture. <laughs> Posted in 2015, by the way. Posted in 2015. I was like, girl, <laughs> here we go. So the thing about it here is, Nick, well, you know what? I, 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 uh, two things. Number one, I don't know what to post. Number two, well, you know, I don't want people to think a certain way, and you know, I'm private. I don't want everybody all up in my life like that. Okay, you you don't have to. Tell, I'm not saying tell everybody your every move. I'm saying paint a picture. But you have to understand what do you want to be known for, and how do you want to make people feel. It goes back to that, right? That is how you craft your social voice. You know, I speak about Chick-fil-A, one, one of the guys that does it the very best from a corporate standpoint is Rodney Bullard. If you were to go to Rodney Bullard's page, Rodney does a few things very, very well that I'm going to encourage you to do. First thing he does is he posts about just a few things. Leadership and what Chick-fil-A is doing. He's what you call a corporate influencer. He leverages Chick-fil-A, and Chick-fil-A leverages him, right? So he'll talk about, you'll see Rodney in action. He'll say, hold my phone, just like I have the sister right here holding my phone. You'll see him in action. All candidates, no poses. It's in action. Like, literally, people want to see you in action. They want to be voyeuristic. They want to watch, let them watch. Don't feel embarrassed. Give your phone to somebody and say, hey, take me in action real quick. Yes. You're, you're creating a narrative. You're painting a picture. Social media is your canvas. All right? What else does he do? Uh, he reposts other people's stuff, but he has his narrative on top. Right? So, you know, he wants to be known as a thought leader. Many of you want to be known as thought leaders, but he understands what he wants to be known for and how he wants to make people feel. So he identifies those posts that other people who follow him might be interested in, and he just doesn't reshare it, but he adds a layer on top. So people always hear his voice. Right? The next thing he does is he creates some content, but it's just in the form of little memes, images, things of that nature. I'm not telling you to spend your whole day. I did not say that because you have jobs, you have family, you don't have time to be doing the most. <laughs> what I'm telling you here is this, don't focus on it, I got one minute left, don't focus on creating content, focus on capturing what it is you do. Focus on capturing what it is. That's all the content you need. Like literally, literally, it's short spurts. It's short spurts. But you're crafting a narrative so that people understand who you are. Because as wonderful as all of you are, all of you, every single one of you, I don't care how executive you are, you are all forgettable. Every last one of you are forgettable. You are totally forgettable until you're not. Social media helps to keep you top of mind, and it also helps to get you noticed. 